It's the SDG Podcast. Before we get started, you can check us out on the web at solutiondesign.com slash podcast or find us on all the social medias, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Solution Design Group. All right, we're back again with another podcast. Uh, welcome, everyone. We got uh, Peter Lawrence with us today and the mighty Chad Jutner. And uh, joining us is a uh, first-time podcaster on yeah. the podcast, Alice and Lorenzo. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I watched your presentation. I think we all did on doing more creative work while having fun and loved it so wanted to talk about it and i thought i'd kick it off with the question is creativity a talent <laughs> you're sending me a softball i appreciate it yeah there it is <laughs> no it is it is not a talent uh I, I based this talk after a lecture by john cleese so that's what i'm going after and one of his main points is that no creativity is not an ability it's not a talent it's not something that you have to be born with it is uh, uh instead something that you can influence it is a way of operating so you're saying that creativity is like a mode you get into yeah his his point and i experienced this in my professional capacity as well is that i to be creative you kind of have to get yourself into this certain mode and this mode is kind of uh, characterized by a lack of pressure a sense of playfulness of um, openness uh, and you kind of need a lot of space and time in order to get into that mode. But as long as you can get into this place where you don't feel like you have to produce something and get through a bunch of tasks where you're not under this kind of pressure to produce something by the end of it, that's when you can really encourage your brain to be more creative, to start uh, getting different ideas, interacting with one another, thinking of things that haven't really been done before. And um, yeah, he, he characterizes it as a sort of a, a sense of play. And that's the most important part in the most talented creatives out there. So it's not just like opening up a blank piece of paper uh, <laughs> and staring at it and saying, I'm going to be creative today. I'm going to do something. <laughs> I, it's setting a I don't want to say setting a mood because I don't want to turn into that kind of podcast. But <laughs> you do light a candle and, you know, yeah. put on music that you like and create an environment for yourself to be creative and not just like sit at the kitchen table with a TV blaring in the background and kids screaming and all this other stuff and saying, all right, I'm going to do something magical right now. That's not how it's worked in my experience. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think I think you do have a lot more success if you can set yourself up to be in that creative space, that that mood. And there are a couple of things that he lists and that I agree with um, that help get into that space. So for one thing, space, right? So you need to tell yourself, I'm going to make myself unavailable for phone calls, from texts, from team messages, whatever. You're, you're going to allow yourself to not be distracted by anything else, screaming children, whatever, the TV. You need time. Uh, and that's about an hour and a half is what he recommends, which is long enough for your mind to kind of quiet down, um, to not be spiraling with all these other things that it might be distracted by like, you know, stuff that you have to get at the grocery store or calls that you need to make, an email that is half written. Um, so it gives you enough time to get past that spiraling, but it's short enough that you don't just lose steam. Um, you can, can kind of give yourself a break at the end. So, so kind of like that meditation where you, the mindfulness meditation, they always describe it as, you know, the first part of that is letting those intrusive thoughts wash over you or getting them out of your system. And there's nothing like a few moments of quiet downtime to let those things just seep right into your head right away at, at the start, right? Like, oh, I just remembered I need to go get some uh, potato chips this afternoon or something like that out of nowhere when, when you certainly weren't thinking about potato chips or doing anything with chips when you started out, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think similar with my uh, struggles with meditation, it can feel like I'm not doing it right. Like my brain won't quiet down. You just, you got to give it time and practice and eventually you'll kind of be able to shift your mind away from those things. And I actually made a point in my presentation, if you can do a little prep work of like doing some mind dumping before you start your open mode session, mm. that can help a lot. So just give yourself 10 or 15 minutes to let your mind do that and 
you write it down in a list or you put things in your calendar, you, you get all those things that your mind is anxious, anxiously coming back to into the uh, organizational spots they belong in, whether that's an email or a calendar or something you text to your partner to do. Um, and then you can start your open mode with uh, a more settled mind. I feel like the closed mode is sort of like where we spend most of our time. Mm-hmm. Because we're task driven and work can be overwhelming. You know, I've got to, especially if it's time based, you know, I think that's why deadlines can hurt a project is because it time, it time boxes things and then a, a puts a lot of pressure on people. And when you're under pressure like that, it's not fun. You need to be having fun when you're being creative. You know, it's a fun thing to do, right. but to get that chance to do it um, and then you know, over time, like, you know, Peter was saying with meditation, you know, at the start of it, I think part of, you know, being more, you know, becoming more experienced with mindfulness meditation, that kind of thing is being able to drop into it faster. Like you can click into it because you're just kind of used to that. You know how that happens. You know what it feels like. Um, do you find that applies with, you know, that you got your you have that hour and a half that it takes to get there. Does that shorten over time when you're intentionally kind of learning how to drop into that mode? Um, I think it sh- you can certainly shorten the period where your mind settles into it. And if you get certain activities that you're familiar with and that you uh, find a lot of success with, you can dive right into those and that can get things going smoothly. But I do think the hour and a half is still a good length of time. Um, that's that's the open mode time that you're hoping right. for, right? Like right. hour and a half, that's kind of the maximum after that. You're, you're kind of slowly shifting back into closed mode or mm. not having as playful a time or whatever right right yeah because i don't is think it is it an hour and a half to to just get to the open mode or is it an hour and a half that you're gonna be able to stay in the open mode the latter yeah the, the open mode session i should say okay should an hour and a half and you're just yeah the first maybe half hour at first you'll need to quiet your mind and then you'll have an hour left for whatever you're gonna do whatever that activity is chad so, um you know you're you're the tech lead on your project and you know you have to be available to be interrupted constantly and you say that you do your programming at like 11 at night <laughs> i do yeah um well i mean i'm lucky i'm 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 on a project with allison so um <clears throat> most of my interruptions throughout the day i don't even consider them interruptions there's just little delights where Allison <laughs> and I will chat throughout the day. So um, it is, uh, so for developers, and I think developers in my role, it is, uh, we, we don't get to do what Allison is describing frequently. And I don't know, Peter, maybe you have a different experience or maybe you've boxed yourself into little time boxes to do this, but it is uh, it is incredibly difficult for me from you know, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to put myself in a mode where I can create or think about, you know, you know, take on a story and write it from to completion and deliver it. So in my role, I don't I, I just set myself up for interruptions throughout the day. Right. And um, you just poke out, you just take little low hanging fruits, like little easier tasks, you know, if you still want to write code once in a while. <laughs> uh, but our ability to do exactly what Allison is describing, I think, Peter, you're a lead on your team is that right um and it, yeah the, like, the interruptions do just they're just they're just coming out of everywhere and and you can't avoid them they're it's nearly impossible um even even though you know working at home makes that much more easy to not have as many things going on and noisy things going on around the office or whatever but um you know when when you have focused time teams is going to bound to go off at least 10 or 15 times. This group, that group, the other group, I like to have my notifications cranked to 11 so that I don't miss anything because if I don't, I tend to have, yeah, I miss direct messages and things like that if I don't get notified for everything. Yeah, and I think- Yeah, I also, I'm listening for problems to come in. And uh, <laughs> it's usually when, when it's happening, somebody is stuck. And so it's like my reaction time and ability to get them unstuck is, is important and being available. Um, I also have deadlines and things, you know, just, I got a bunch of stuff to do and it's no fun uh, when it's like that and you got pressure on you and it's, I notice 
um, you know, watch me run around at the big event. I am not in open mode. Just uh, calm, cool, and collected, slowly meandering from one room to the other, not not looking as though all the microphones <laughs> are not working and all the cameras are broken and yeah, everything like that, right? I don't know what you're talking about, man. I was pretty relaxed at the big event. <laughs> well, I mean, I so, think that gets to how, you know, it's not like closed mode is a bad thing. Like there's a lot of work totally appropriate for closed mode, that's the mode where you're getting stuff done. You're knocking stuff off of your to-do list. It's um, a mode where, you know, you're not playful. You're, you've are you got this sense of, like, tension or maybe low-key anxiety. And um, that's what gets us productive and going quickly. And there's a lot of work where you don't need a whole lot of creativity, right? You just need to get stuff done. And that's totally appropriate for closed mode. But I think, Kyle, like you said earlier, the problem is when you're stuck in closed mode, too much, um, too long, and you try to do every sort of task in that mode. Um, so it's just kind of recognizing what work is appropriate for which mode. And if you are stuck on something that requires some creativity and you don't have that time because you're, you're getting pinged all the time and you can't find that hour and a half, I think there are some things that can still help out. So one of the things that we talked about a lot in the presentation was um, how instead of just banging your head against a problem to try to come up with something as fast as possible, I think we've all had that experience of like, I walked away from my desk and I had lunch or I took a little like 10 minute walk around the block, took a shower, took a nap, whatever. And that space um, where your mind is just kind of like gently resting against, against the problem instead of like really drilling into it, um, when it can do that for a long period of time, you can get a lot of inspiration that way too. Chad, this is something I've seen you do, I've seen Greg do, I've seen a, a lot of people do this successfully. Is like, we've been hammering on this too hard, I'm, I need to take a walk. <laughs> Does anyone wanna join me to like go to the lunchroom or just walk around the courtyard or something for a couple of minutes? And um, even that little break can help because it is kind of like a micro open mode moment, right? Where your mind is relaxed, you're not under pressure, you are doing something again, maybe a little meditative where you don't have to think too hard, but your brain has the space to start making some new connections and thinking more creatively. We also have to stop saying the word W-A-L-K because I've got a little fella right next to me that <laughs> hears that. And he is just like laser beams right now. It's no treat. Oh, yeah. Like that. <laughs> Actually, you know, honestly, he doesn't really know that word because uh, um, I call it something else and I'm not going to tell you guys what I call it. So. <laughs> That's good because yeah. we would probably say that many, many times. Yeah. Um, so it's hard at work to, to play all day or to play any time of the day, right? How do you fit that in or what what's... Is, is there a time of day that works better for this? Or is it you have to find your own time of day that works best for you? Is that kind of the way it goes? I think so. I think different people have different preferences, times of days when their creativity or energy ebbs and flows. Like for me, for whatever reason, I um, thrive at like the three o'clock to five o'clock time frame. Wow. Uh, which I know is opposite from a lot of people. But <laughs> I feel like that's when I've gotten a lot of junk done for the day. And now I'm stuck with the remainders. And in some ways, like ideally, I've kind of reviewed it in the morning. First thing, if I have this screen that I know I need to work on later, or this design that's outstanding. And again, if I can just kind of let my brain stew on that for a little while throughout the day, and then I have time towards the end where a lot of people have like logged off if they start their day early, fewer pings. I have that kind of two hour frame towards the end of the day or even just that hour and a half we talked about to come back to it and see what my brain came up with and have that open mode. And um, that is what works for me, but other people they'll wake up in the morning and they'll say, I had a great night of sleep and my brain was working on this stuff overnight and I'm gonna like write all this stuff down. So I think it, it is a personal preference kind of thing, but in my experience have to sometimes put a block on your calendar where you are not allowing people to schedule over it and say this is my creative time and mm. you might feel guilty about that like oh what if they, people need to schedule a meeting like I'm not actually busy you are busy like this is really important people are paying us to be our most innovative creative professional selves they're they're they want us to create innovation so right. If the way to do that is blocking this time, that is an investment that they should be supporting. Yeah, I, I 
when I used to smoke, I'd have those breaks throughout the day. And now that I don't, and I haven't for years, and I don't condone smoking, kids. Uh, it's bad for you. Um, I will I will start my day and, and then look at the clock, and it's 4 in the afternoon and realize I haven't moved. Um, you know, it's like setting, I probably should set an alarm. There's probably things I should do, but it's, it's like I just want to get stuff done so much that I drill into it and don't stop. Um, what's good, though, is my chair is not super comfortable <laughs> uh to sit all the days so it does get me up it is it's comfortable it's just not all day comfortable it's not a recliner it's not a not a it actually recliner, is a recliner or anything like that right uh so when working from home i'm lucky that i have a uh, another buddy on the project that does the same role as i do for a different part of the application him and i actually will instead of taking a lunch break right we'll grab our lunch and we'll uh we'll eat um but we both play uh, Call of Duty Warzone. And so if we really, if we need to, um, you know, instead of like leaving our computers and going up and playing, and, you know, eating lunch and not being connected at all, uh, we will actually fire up Warzone. And um, that is a nice little uh, relaxation thing that we do um, in the middle of the day, you know, instead of, um, you know, when, when I can't go out and walk or whatever, uh, that helps clear my mind too, to be, uh, to be able to do that with him. And we actually, Talk about work stuff in Warzone, uh, <laughs> which really confuses the other players sometimes. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> we'll be talking about something pretty, you know, low level, uh, not really, um, you're not really able to identify what exactly we're working on, but we'll throw ideas back and forth um, or when we need it. But, a the, you know, like an hour away is an hour away whatever you do with it it's an hour you're not working you're taking that time so if it's if it's playing video games taking a walk meditating napping whatever it is um you know it's your time but when like it's work time but you need to go into that zone and you take that like i'll go um if i have to get away from my computer i'll just go sit in the lobby and chat with jill uh that usually gets me out of that kind of that stress you know heads down frantic working mode and uh you know back in fun fun mode and when things are light and fun and easy and nothing's breathing down my neck and i don't have a deadline you know that's when i'm really best at doing those creative tasks and um solving problems because i think Problem solving is a creative endeavor. Unless you have a really good memory and you've dealt with it a hundred times and then you're <laughs> like, oh, it's this. Yeah. Yeah. I so, think anything that creates that time pressure of like, I have to be creative by the end of the day. <laughs> uh, it just, it doesn't work out that great. Because um, one of the other points that he makes in John Cleese in his lecture and that I agree with is, you know, you, you might not only need that open mode hour and a half for time, you also ideally need time in terms of like when a decision needs to be made, when you need to decide on an idea that you come up with and commit to it. Because ideally, something that's long been known in the UX design world, ideally you can stay in the ideation phase as long as possible. So you come up with as many ideas as you can before you commit to one and start going right. down that path. Because what happens if you don't, like, let's say you come up with maybe three ideas and that's all the time you have and the business says, okay, we need to hurry. We have deadlines to hit. Pick this one because it's the best of those three. It might seem like you're going faster. It might seem like you're saving time by cutting yourself short in that creative beginning phase. But at the end of the day, second idea or maybe all three of those first ideas that you came up with suck. Um, you're sprinting <laughs> in maybe a wrong direction. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be costing yourself time and money for the rest of that product's lifespan to uphold a castle that you built on a swamp, basically. Like So so is there a concept yeah. of design debt that gets built into some of these things? We've talked about technical debt, but is design debt a thing where you've designed it sort of, sort of wrong, sort of right, and you're kind of stuck with it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's happened to me where, okay, I think this idea is good enough. Uh, it's all I have time for. Let's propose it. And then partway through development, it's like, oh, I boxed myself in here and I'm not finding a great way out. And it's too late to tell the developers to just undo everything and start from scratch. So we're stuck. In the developers discussion. love mm -hmm. undoing everything. <laughs> yeah. I disagree with Allison, everything Allison just said. I don't think she's ever designed anything or boxed herself in anywhere. 
uh, at least <laughs> in the three years that I've worked with her. Uh, you're too kind. And you're lying for my benefit, but thank you for doing that. Well, there was the one time. Um, <laughs> we, yeah. we, uh, we went down, a, we, we went on a little journey together and, uh, and I think we, uh, we pulled out at the appropriate moment. Yeah. I just so. finished, um, building an app in Nintex. I, I did, I programmed it, uh, Chad in Nintex and, uh, which used to be part of SharePoint. I just had to say SharePoint. Um, and I went down a, like the totally wrong path, like right away. I committed to it to the point where I got other people involved in the bad choice and then i changed direction completely um I, I don't know if they noticed or not i didn't even bother telling them um that way i said we had to do it we don't have to do it that way but like i was in that frantic get it done mode and i took the first decision that popped in my head the first choice and just blazed trail <laughs> instead of like taking that step back and um, trying to get into that mode. I think I'm really bad at getting into the mode. I think I just find myself there, um, usually based on fun. And I like to have fun and joke around and keep things light. But I'm really bad at that when I'm in closed mode and just have tons of stuff to do. Well, that happens when, to I mean, that happened. I mean, that happened to me with my big event presentation, right? Like, I'm not a huge proponent of showing slides, right? I like to show real things. Um, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but you know, you spend, I spent significant amount of time developing one thing, changing directions multiple times, and then um, kind of putting it, you know, mothballing it for a little bit and pulling it off the shelf kind of last minute and trying to get it running again. And bad things happen and uh, you just make the most of it. And it's not always, I mean, even the, the act of going through and screwing up um, is also useful to know, oh, that's not a thing that I, or, or I learned five things by screwing that up right like when i did right. the uh what was it the colorization project using ai um learned a whole bunch of things through that that i kind of stumbled through talking about during the big event but one of them is um libraries and gpu recognition isn't quite there yet for for certain <laughs> things and certain configurations um i've learned uh, we learned a whole bunch of ways to troubleshoot a model training failure we learned um uh we learned that ai and taste buds don't necessarily match quite yet um and a handful of other things so i don't necessarily like allison talked about you know um going down a design path and boxing yourself in with a design um that isn't necessarily feasible um when that happened to us we learned a whole bunch of things through that process and it you know, I think, Peter, you called it design debt, and it turned into a little design debt, maybe some tech debt. But it was actually kind of a good thing for the project because it uh, there were a lot of patterns that we developed um, going into that and then um, even better patterns coming out of it that we implemented for the life cycle of the project. And the fact that it happened early really, really helped us. So, And if you never get yourself not... boxed in somewhere, then until, you know, a lot further down the path and uh, all the things that we've talked about with, you know, agile and and things fail fast you know get get the design out there so that people can see it and and hate it and then you know fix it rather than um and i don't mean hate but disagree with or whatever you want to call it i don't want to make anybody too upset but yeah and not to get too far into it but the whole concept of failing fast and iterating and everything else when you're dealing with things that take um that just take physically take a long long time that you can't chunk out into little things that you can report on through a process uh right that's going to require some new thinking i think i mean firsthand experience for me not just my big event thing but through some client work is some big big ideas take a lot longer framework allows to flush out there's there's a lot of people that have estimated things uh, underestimated things in uh, myself included right where this big idea will only take a very short amount of time this is going to be great oh wait I'm trying to do this and I'm struggling and finding myself having problems and now I need to take a walk and go figure out how to how to how to actually solve this problem because <laughs> if I don't it'll never happen. <clears throat> we t we talked about tunnel vision a little bit yesterday. Do you want to cover that a little bit, Allison? Yeah, so I think you know going back to closed and open mode and feeling that pressure to produce versus that open playful mind the danger of trying to be creative in that closed mode 
is one of the things that makes you most productive in that mode is that you're very focused and mm-hmm. that you're you're kind of looking at the trees in that mode, right? And, and instead of the forest, what you'll tend to do is if given a problem, your brain will tend to go to solutions that it's seen a million times before or that are very easy or maybe very literal um, because it's trying to save time and that's uh, the easiest way to do that is to go back to pattern recognition and the things that it's seen a lot and that's where you get that tunnel vision of well okay this is uh, the first idea I came up with and not very creative but it'll do and if you go ahead and start sprinting forward with that you're not going to be super innovative but if you give yourself time to open up and experiment and um, Chad mentioned like he goes on those Call of Duty uh, <laughs> sessions with Greg. This is especially helpful if you do it with other people, like if you riff with other folks mm. in, in your play and if you have a sense of humor about it too, even better. I mean, John Cleese is a comedian, so he talked a lot about humor and the role it can play in this. Um, but if you do all of that, you're in that more like seeing the forest. You're opening yourself up to new interpretations of things and especially if you do some of the activities that I talked about in the presentation so these are things like you know taking inspirational tours of looking at your favorite web apps or your favorite websites maybe just some art maybe some really cool code snippets or whatever it may be anything that inspires you you're going to start making new connections, putting things together in new ways. And and that's where that creativity has a, a, a chance to flourish, I would say. And if you force yourself to stay in there for a certain amount of time and say, like, I'm not going to stop until I come up with at least eight ideas and seven of them could be total stinkers and they could be really stupid. But I don't care. I'm just playing right now. <laughs> like it does, You're not judging your ideas during open mode. You're not saying this will work or this won't. You're just getting them out there, out of your brain and onto paper or the computer or whatever it may be. And after that, just quantitative <laughs> over qualitative ideas are out there, um, then you can go back to closed mode afterwards and start doing that judging and taking with other people and seeing what's feasible, what are the pros and cons. But um, to get out of that tunnel vision, you just got to get a lot of ideas out. <laughs> um, and that's where some extra time is really helpful. Nice. So if if you're a leader of people um, and if they're not running, you know, if they're just walking and not running you or, or they're just sitting doing something. Um, walking relaxing. around looking at forests, right? Yes. <laughs> looking at their favorite websites. You're like, you know, get back to work. And it's like, well, I am working. You know, what's the message for leadership there um, when leading creative people? I think some of it is optics, right? I think you can't just say I'm going to go on an hour and a half walk. I don't think that'll ever go over well, no matter what tips I can give you. (laughs) Um, If you can frame things kind of like we talked about and say, you know, okay, for my time frame, based off of my um, professional experience in the creative field, I'm going to need a week of ideation time. And by the end of that week, I'm going to deliver you these artifacts, these mock-ups, these QA test plans, these dev prototypes, whatever it is. give them a plan for what you are going to produce by the end of this period that you're going to try to advocate for yourself getting to show that you are being productive. Um, You are going to be doing work during this time. And if you can phrase it in terms of like dollars and say, you know, by getting this week where I can ideate when it's really cheap, you're just paying for my bill rate and you're not paying to like develop the wrong thing and maintain it for forever. If we can stay in this cheap ideation phase for just that week, you could save yourself tons of money by if you'd just given me a day or two. Um, And again, you now have to maintain a product for forever that is generating uh, more help tickets, more customer service calls. It's getting more bugs, so you need more support and more dev time. And you're gonna have to refactor it, you know, like it's an investment. And if you can phrase it that way, that's what businesses like to hear things in terms of, right, is just doing the right type of work at the right time in the cheapest way possible. And I think that's what Kyle's describing is kind of a it's a generational thing, right? I think some of the younger generations in the workforce understand exactly what Allison is talking about and give you space for that kind of thinking and that kind of, you know, creativity. I think the the generation probably ahead of Peter and I even uh, might still be in that old older school mindset where they, they just see 
you know, Allison outside running her toes through the grass or whatever. Uh, and be like, <laughs> what is she doing? Whereas me and Peter will be like, ah, I'm coming up with ideas. Um, right. Thinking. Out thinking. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times where they talk about, you know, seeing someone at their desk just sitting back and thinking that it's frustrating for people of a certain mindset to to see that and just be like doing anything right now why aren't you working and it's like well i'm thinking about a problem and maybe that's where the the walks came from is that uh, people tended to it was more acceptable to to go enjoy some fresh air and clear clear your head or whatever than than it was to sit back and just think about a problem and try to tackle it and get into the right mindset to to you know, have an open mode and and tackle things. My uh, my website of choice when I was thinking uh, in the past was remember Slashdot. That was uh, that I would just dive into that for probably a little too long. Uh, but that was my before I liked to do, to go on walks. That was my uh, thing that I used to clear my head. Or before Warzone was a thing. <laughs> I played Lunar Lander, the dumbest, <laughs> most simple, but I could play that for for hours. Just try not to crash that little ship. Don't crash just a wireframe thing. But the you know the those kind of things like doing dishes with somebody, playing catch. You know, I think those are great ways of unlocking that. You know, your closed mode and and becoming open. Um, you I know, know, there's. If you want to become open at my house, there is a stack of di my dishwasher isn't working still. I have not had time to fix it. <laughs> my, uh, you open my cupboards to see all my dishes, and they're all made of paper and plastic. So <laughs> know thyself. Um, so as a as a as a manager of, of creative people, would you drive that that approach of getting in the you know taking that time, taking that week, you know, making sure they're taking breaks and doing something mindless or like not necessarily mindless, but just um, more fun, you know, yeah. as a as a company. Like, okay, everybody, we're gonna go do this for five minutes or half an hour. That's interesting. I think I would encourage the culture of doing that, and um, I would encourage people to find ways that work for them. I don't think it would. <laughs> Always work. Adding structure is not going right. to help. Right. <laughs> I'm just trying to think. That might be kind of an oxymoron. Like, I'm going to force you to have fun now. It is yes. fun time. Like, that might not work for some people, and you might be taking them out of their enclosed mode, and they're, like, getting something really important done, and they're in a flow, and, like, time to go have fun like they're not going to appreciate that very much but if you can say yeah this is very much a team where if you see someone taking a walk or if you see them having like a little workshopping session in the meeting room over there and they're doing post-its and whiteboard drawings together and having a good time like that is work and i support that as long as obviously they need to be producing work and committing themselves to any deadlines that they've uh, indeed committed themselves to so if they said i need a week they need to have something by the end of that week like they um, said they needed to and i think you know we talked about walks and dishes and all that sort of stuff for open mode but there are more i guess um <laughs> traditional work activities that you can do like one example i gave is crazy eights so this is a, a tool in the design world where you take a piece of printer paper and you fold it um, so that there are eight little rectangles on that paper and you set a timer for eight minutes and you fill out each of those little boxes with one idea. So you get one minute per box and that's a really quick way of forcing yourself. Come up with a bunch of ideas quickly without wasting a bunch of time or like taking the time to judge any of these ideas too, too long. Again, judging can come later. Um, so stuff like that, stuff like mood boards or canvases or you know, it could be little sketches, storyboards. There are some activities you can do that will put artifacts at the end of them. And that can be a way of showing your boss or the business like, hey, I am doing stuff. It may look sloppy or whatever, but like I'm not just walking around the whole time and you know there are some things that will look a little bit more productive if that's what they need to see to feel comfortable so like a screen print of the final score at call of duty yeah there you go yeah <laughs> i was I got it done so i have been that's at different places in my career where going off going off to a conference room or going off off-site or whatever has been totally accepted totally been super comfortable with it and nobody looked at it twice um i think you know talking to kyle's point back in the day you know people walking 
outside to get some not fresh air into their lungs and come back more energized, I guess. I'm not sure exactly what the the whole goal of going out for a cigarette <laughs> was, but, uh, you know, they they would take those breaks and, and other folks might take a, you know, a jaunt around, around the building or something like that or around the parking lot. And um, going out to lunch was another one of those where there's some pl- t- places where you go out to lunch as a group or go out to lunch in subgroups to kind of work on problems um, or go sit up at the cafeteria was another common thing where you just kind of like, I need to be at a desk that's not mine or at a place to sit that's not the place where I sit to do boring work. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, coming from that, you know, like being the son of my father, the disciplinarian, <laughs> you're if you're not working hard, then you're goofing off. So now for me to take that time, it's like I feel like I'm guilty of goofing off. If you can lean, you can clean, right? Yeah. Back to the restaurant days. And and some some of those things, maybe not as creative an endeavor as um, developing enterprise software, but, you know, there's a certain creativity <laughs> there, too, that and some goofing off that would happen, too. Right. At restaurants and things like that. That just hopefully happen after hours and not those are team building exercises. Yeah, you know, right. They're very intentional. Well, I mean, that's, you know, like had, trying to, you know, have fun when you're overloaded is very, very difficult. And then being creative when you're not having fun is very, very difficult. And you don't always choose your workload. Um, sometimes it is thrust upon you um, in the morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> and yeah, and you have the end of the day. If but it's, lucky. yeah, it's um, like, how do you deal with that? Like where you're just given too much to do? I think it it's not too different from when you're given too much to do, whether it's creative or not. You just have to say, okay, my plate is this full. I have time for this. Help me prioritize this stuff. Maybe a bunch of this stuff falls in the closed mode and I can knock that out. Um, and that might feel more productive, but some of these things, if you ask whoever is assigning this to you, might not be as high priority as really knocking it out of the park on this big thing that needs problem mm. solving or that needs like a creative direction like that might be the real money maker the, the thing that we absolutely have to get right so i think some things may feel more urgent but in actuality are less of a priority and if you say what i need to do to do this big thing right is kick these other things down the road that's what i have to do like i only have so many hours in the workday, and that's this is what I require and able to do my job properly. So it's just advocating and, and saying what you need in order to do each type of task and saying, help me prioritize these things and I'll tell you what's going to be able to get done in, at the end of the day. And if, if you're on a team and you trust your, you know, the people that you're working with, I mean, it's a collaborative effort, right? Like we, we had this on a thing that we worked on, Allison, where some folks thinks, think one thing is a priority and we just kind of know internally as a team, like, yeah, that's really important. But this one little thing that you don't necessarily see is blocking this mm. entire mushroom cloud of issues. Mm. And so trust us. Luckily, we we worked with uh, incredibly reasonable people that did. Um, it was it was fine. So when, and you earned that trust, right? I don't know how, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I heard it was all happy hours. I mean, we did have a sip or two every once in a while, and that does actually go a long way towards um, getting understanding uh, mindsets. Understanding, yeah. Actually, I mean, more like understanding motivations, right? Because right. I think I get, I, I, I hate the word mindset, but I do like understanding what's motivating different people in their right. role to push for like what we see and what we know to be non-essential things. And um, you don't always get out of people in, in the office or around other ears, um, their real motivations for like whatever, but boy, you bring them to, you know, main street or an American Legion or wherever. And um, after a couple of sips, you actually understand where things are coming from. And it's, it is genuinely one of the, I mean, I don't, understand why it's not done more maybe i do i mean maybe folks aren't comfortable going there but like you really do get to the motivations right and understanding motivations and then them understanding yours goes a long way to establishing trust and getting us the leeway to you know let allison take long walks to design something or um 
leaving Greg and I alone while we're in a, um, while we're in the lobby playing Warzone or whatever that is. I, I think it's it's kind of a caricature of my personality now. Like, oh, it's Chad. He's at Happy Hour. Blah blah blah. That's funny. Uh, but far as uh, in service to the project, um, especially early, early on, uh, it was it was massive, and we had so many um, stakeholders drop in, drop through, and understanding where they're coming from, and understanding and letting them know who we are, and that we're not just you know mindless automations. Uh, it was super helpful. So you know that more informal, relaxed environment, stress free, you know, more. Open. How do you do that during the day? Uh, <laughs> Without the alcohol, <laughs> without breaking the, the rules. Le- the Legion opens up at nine, right? Yeah. Oh, you, uh, yeah, I think we should ask Dan Shui that question. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, stuff we do, whether it's development, like whatever we do, there's there's creativity that's required. You know, these are not tools just for roles that are kind of under the creative umbrella right. of making something. So... I think there's something in this for for everybody. You know, I watched the John Cleese, like it's a 30 minute talk he gives, but he also wrote a book about creativity. Um, And he did a lot of stuff like that for businesses. He didn't just do the Monty Python and the movies and stuff. He actually um, worked on a lot of that kind of stuff. Hmm. So I learned a lot today. (laughs) Any uh, parting thoughts, any you have left? Hello, do puppy. Not say, do not say the word. <laughs> oh. The W-A-L-K word. Yeah. Hey. They do learn to spell, so be careful. <laughs> Eventually. Um, so my parting thought is try it. You might be surprised at how awesome it is to take that break, to let your mind wander, to let your you know mind go off and do the solving while you're not paying attention to it, and then coming back and having that solution presented to you when you bring it front of mind again. You're really like, wow, that was amazing. Um, I know I've said it before that, you know, sometimes you look back on code that you've written both positively and negatively. What the heck was I thinking that day? Um, sometimes it's, I must have been creative because that is an amazing solve. And I, I don't know how I did that. And then there's the other side too. But <laughs> take time to be creative. I liked uh, what you said about, you know, communicating what you're going to need in terms of that time, like give me this week or this day so that I can get into this mode where I need to be and spend and give it that due time. Like, I like that. Is there like, how do you, how do you measure that though? I mean, how do you know that it's, is that just a standard like number you're throwing out of a week? Um, is it scale? Well, if it's the gut feel and it's feel, well, yeah, you know, after doing this you, for 12 years, you just kind of know a screen of this complexity. I'd better give it a couple yeah. of days, you know, go with your gut. Yeah. Can't buy it. All right. Well, I think with that, we can shut her down and say goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you guys. Solution Design Group is a digital product consultancy in Minneapolis. Check us out on the web at solutiondesign.com or look for us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Solution Design Group.